Okay, welcome to Scalable Data Science and Distributed Machine Learning. So this is the course site, it's completely dynamic. So today's lectures will be available. I'll show you how to load it and get it. So before we get into, okay, so let me, let me explain what this course is and what the pathways are and course modules are and, uh, what, uh, how, to, how to actually get credit for this, right? So the course is broken into um, three HP modules. Uh, the first three HP module everyone has to take. And there will be some kind of uh, um, assessment. Right? So I would really like you to participate in the course. We will we'll see how it goes. Okay, it's quite flexible. So as long as you, you're all learning and happy, that's good. Um, the way the first three HP is going to be broken down is um, essentially we will go through um, this module. So this is introduction to scalable data science and distributed machine learning. Um, it will start with uh, an introduction to Apache Spark. And we will use the language of Apache Spark primarily. So it will be Scala. Most of you probably know Python, right? Um, so we will use Python much later when we go into deep learning. But uh, for now, we will learn Scala first, OK? Uh, and then they, all the languages interoperate in Spark anyway. So uh, then the second module, well, yeah. Maybe the first module, we will already cover all of this. So each of this is a one day workshop in an industrial setting. So this course sort of has been, um, what do you call it? Uh, prototyped in an industry setting since 2016. So, um, but we will do it a lot slower here, okay? Because we have only two 50 minute periods per meeting. And there'll be roughly two meetings per week. And I think I mistakenly put one meeting on Good Friday, so we'll probably cancel it or, or rearrange it. Um, but yeah, so most probably we will cover these two these two um, 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 topics. So this one is introduction to distributed simulation, uh, various uh, supervised and unsupervised ML algorithms using Spark's um, machine learning pipelines. Um, and a bit of GraphX, which is a uh, distributed vertex programming, as we'll see, and a bit more about lower level RDDs. And then the second 3HP module will probably, yeah, either we go into streaming, structured streaming, or um, maybe deep learning and distributed deep learning. So the last module, if people are still there and, uh, interested will be 4HP. And that's uh, a lot more um, individualized projects or group projects. So the idea there is hopefully when from the first two modules, you'll learn enough to uh, do your own project in a group. And uh, that's the main idea. And the projects will, uh, yes, yeah, so the project mainly will allow you to write notebooks and you know put it in GitHub. So it's also uh, partly to help you build your profile in GitHub, right? So, okay, so all of you probably got uh, this little five minute video on how to create a Databricks Community Edition. So yeah, maybe I should have said this, all of you should maybe bring your laptops so you can keep up with the material as it's progressing, right? So I think, the wireless should be handle should be able to handle all our loads, I think. So um, yeah, so pull out the laptops and maybe drop down into Databricks Community Edition, and I will show you. Uh, so so this is the main URL for the course. Uh, yeah, so it's GitHub.com slash lamastex slash scalable data minus science. Maybe I can, I can put this in, um, in here somewhere. Um, let's see. Yeah, so I think it's, uh, yeah, 
it's it's basically this this one. So you can go here if you like, and um, so if you go to the actual GitHub page for this, there is uh, a folder called DBC Archives right here, and then here. 37 minutes ago, I pushed the first part of the first module's content. Okay. So is everyone here? So it's basically scalable data science, DBC archives latest. Is it too bright? So I'm not sure how to. better and... okay the url doesn't get bigger sorry um so then what you want to do is go here and you can just download this. It's just a compressed uh, archive file, basically. So you can just download it and put it into your um, laptop. So then when you go to, um, is everyone at this step? Okay. So then um, what you want to do is this folder you made uh, sorry, my, my, my thing is a bit of a zoo. So this folder you mailed it made in the workspace in your Databricks community edition, right? So you want to go um, import and then you can just browse and bring this uh, stuff you just downloaded here. So it's download and uh, it's this one. Okay, uh, and you just open it. So I will cancel it because I already have it here. So then it should it should have this folder with these notebooks in here. Okay. Um, okay. So I'll pause for a minute. So I have also, while well, we are offline for a minute, um, how many of you know any GVM language? So this is like Java, Scala, etc. Okay, good. All right, so how many of you know how to build libraries in the JVM language? So, Okay, of course, from scientific computing, I hope. Yeah, so you're, you're familiar with tools like SBT and Maven, stuff like this. Bonus. Okay. All right, so, okay, good, good news. We won't go into this, but bad news is this is really important if you wanna go beyond the confines of pre-made libraries, okay? But, uh, Okay, so now um, I guess how many of you don't know Python? I mean, no meaning familiarity with Python. Okay, you have, okay, only one person. Okay, um, all right, that's uh, that's good. So then, um, how many of you are familiar with notebook environments? Okay, most of you, right? So you know, like uh, probably Jupyter. Right? Uh, any other notebook environments? Uh, some of you know SageMath. It's basically Jupyter notebook server also. Okay. So Databricks is actually a notebook environment, right? So it's just a read, evaluate, print loop on the web browser. So we will mostly be doing things on notebook. 
And what about Docker? How many of you have used one, two, three, four, five? Okay. Yeah, so, um, okay. So let's see, maybe we should have a little um, tutorial on Docker. So most of you have Macs. Who has Windows laptop? Okay, so that's more complicated. All right, maybe we won't get into Docker. So, so anyway, so Docker uh, and also setting up your own environment to build libraries are an important skill. But uh, maybe we won't get into this here. So everyone is here? Okay. Um, sorry, everyone has uploaded the triple zero one SDS three X Spark. Okay. Um, hmm. Oh, right. Well, I guess I paused instead of pause share instead of pause recording. Okay, so let's uh, let's go into uh, the first notebook. So this is a high level introduction for the course. Um, so we basically refer to this as SDS three X, uh, the acronym. It's because it's built on Spark three point X most of the time. Later on, if we get into geospatial computing we may get into a, a lower version of Spark because some libraries don't work in this version. So these are the, the, the books that are recommended. So uh, this one is uh, High Performance Spark. So this is to, if you want to get a much better idea of what's really going on, uh, this is a good, good resource. Um, I think these are all available from our libraries if you log into a library. Another really good book is this one. It's by uh, um, Bill Chambers and Mate Zaharia. So um, this one is also very good. Um, and this one, I actually have a hard copy of this. Uh, it should also be available from the library. If you were to get one book, I would recommend this. And in the second chapter, it goes into how to set up Spark in your own laptop, in your local environment. You should really do that. Maybe we should have a whole lab on how to do things locally. Because the downside is if you don't do that, you're going to just be hooked on Databricks, which is OK, but it's, uh, it can bite you later. OK. All right. Um, yeah, in this course, we probably won't go too much into understanding the uh, asymptotic properties of algorithms, um, but uh, because that builds on some understanding of algorithms at an undergraduate level. Um, I'm just curious, how many of you have taken a course on uh, algorithms and data structures? Okay, oh, that's good. Okay, so. Um, yeah, so in classical undergraduate study of algorithms, right, you assume a single machine architecture, right, where sort of you're trying to study the algorithm's uh, behavior uh, um, as a function of the size of the input with respect to how quickly it finishes the computation. That's called time complexity and how much memory is needed for the data structure used by the algorithm, right? That's called space complexity, right? In distributed computing, you have a third dimension, uh, and that is actually communication complexity, because now you have a whole bunch of machines that are solving a problem for you. So the communication between different computers, different machines, also has to be taken into account. And at a high level, that's kind of the main main distinguishing feature for distributed algorithms. Okay. Um, so I think this one. So if you really kind of want to do this uh, a bit more. There is actually this PDF. Um, there is a course currently running in, uh, in Stanford. Uh, I think it just started. So that is this course, Distributed Algorithms and Optimization. It's by Reza Zadeh, so it's a bit more theoretical study of algorithms. 
So actually module four, I think only one person is taking module four. Module four is basically sitting in on Reza's course and, and doing some homework with the Stanford people. But uh, I think there's only one student who sort of, um, but anyway, if you want to do module four later, uh, I, can, I can hook you up, okay? There is a lot of typos uh, as, as usual. So I think, uh, yeah, that's the breaks. Okay, so yeah, so this is markdown. So later on, we will see this in, in detail. So in Databricks, every notebook, uh, I mean, every notebook is made up of cells, just like uh, Jupyter. I pattern notebooks. So in this, uh, the first uh, line says person MD. So it says this cell uh, is a markdown cell. Okay. So markdown process takes over as a set of level one, bolding, italic fonts, and so on. Okay. Um, so later on, if you do the project, you, your job will be to actually, here's the typo, put two. Okay. Um, you, you know, when you do your project, you will be writing a notebook uh, that you will make publicly available. And then your presentation of the project will be a little video. So, um, okay, this is a bit about me. I've got 16 years of experience in academic research, and then about three to five years of experience as part-time and full-time in, in the industry. I work one day a week in Stockholm for this company called Combiont. Um, Okay, that's enough about me. So what is the data science process? It basically is, in sort of a nutshell, it's, to, it's just yeah, a way to make money from, from data, okay? So we have raw data collected from various sensors and in different fields, right? Uh, it doesn't matter, any field of science or engineering, you collect lots of data, you, you process the data, you clean the data, and then you do some exploratory analysis and your exploratory analysis feeds back into processing the data and cleaning the data. Then of course you use models and algorithms to sort of make sense of the data and get some kind of a value. What is value here? You essentially help some decision maker make decisions, right? So they can be scientists, test hypotheses or engineers who wanna optimize some design or, or business uh, people who want to, I don't know, optimize some business process, right? So that's the idea. And then the core skills are math, stats, and computer science. And of course, on top of this, you have domain expertise. So it's this interaction of math, stats, computer science, and domain expertise that defines data science. It's not anything new. It's just this combination of skills has become sort of valuable in the last decade or so, okay? And you usually have an entrepreneurial angle so that you try to build a data product and sort of sell it back, okay? So it's sort of, yeah. It's also some business, right? Uh, and of course you have to pay attention to ethics and laws as well, because you're always operating in a jurisdiction. So that's basically <clears throat> the data science process and scalable data science is just making this sort of big data friend, okay? Um, okay, so scalability refers to the ability of the data science process to scale to massive data sets. And uh, for this, the crucial workhorse is distributed fault tolerant computing, okay? So distributed because we need more than one computer because the data just doesn't fit into one hard drive, right? Like, I don't know, my, mine is half a terabyte. Um, so I don't know, more modern machines will have a few terabytes, but if the data is hundreds of terabytes, what are you going to do? So this is uh, basically you have to distribute the computation and of course it has to be fault tolerant. Your fault means physical failure of machines, right? The machine can fail because I don't know, the hard drive fails, the memory chip fails and processor fails or bus fails or communications busted, cables fail, right? So, uh, so when you have thousands of machines working at the same time, right? And you're doing a computation for say three hours, the probability of any one of these systems in one of these thousand machines failing is gets very high. So, so the idea is somehow you have to guarantee at the software level that the computation will finish even as components fail in the distributed system. So that's fault tolerance, okay? 
Uh, I will go a little bit into the history of where we got here and why we got here. Uh, a lot of it starts at Google um, over a decade ago. Um, so I, I think you can read these things. So most of you, um, yeah, know the stuff. Um, so it's basically, it's an integrated skill set spanning mathematics, machine learning, artificial intelligence, statistics, databases, optimization, and also a, a very deep understanding of your domain, right? So uh, it's a, it's, an, it's a couple couple papers here. Can can read um, from ACM um, and. Okay, so, so recent progress in ML is due to development of new algorithms and theory. And at the same time, it has to have, uh, uh, you know, insights that come from domain experts working with data scientists. Okay. So this is just an embed from Wikipedia. Um, so a lot of times I embed content from Wikipedia instead of writing my own content or slides. So one quick note is you can chase link within links in Wikipedia like this one, say. So if you go like this, you're gonna drop into this iframe embed. So if you wanna go back, then you have to sort of right click and go back. Okay, <laughs> otherwise it's, uh, okay. So I'll, you'll see later how this is all done with Scala code. Okay, so that's a bit about data science process, right? Now, what is data engineering? Uh, there is also another sort of area called machine learning engineering and machine learning operations. So these are all titles in industry, mainly to emphasize uh, different skill sets they expect from uh, personnel working for them. So data engineers are, um, you know, slightly different in that they usually have a, a much better understanding of the system. Um, they usually work at a slightly lower level than data scientists. So data scientists these days typically work in a REPL environment on notebooks, but uh, data engineers usually are, I don't know, one can say often providing a support role for data scientists. They are much closer to databases, distributed file stores, doing extract, transform, load operations, and so on, right? Helping data scientists with feature engineering and so on. So it's usually a team effort, but what often happens is, uh, depending on the company, the culture, and so on, it is really, really good to, if, if you're a data scientist, it's really good to know about some data engineering and vice versa, because it saves days and maybe even more, maybe sometimes weeks. Um, if, if, if there is a lot more uh, understanding between data scientists and data engineers, like what they do and uh, how they can actually work together. So this O'Reilly uh, data scientists versus data engineers thing has a list of uh, what data engineers should have uh, as their skill sets. So this is about having um, Linux operating systems and being comfortable using command line. So how many of you are comfortable with Linux and command line? Okay, very good. Um, we, will, we will play around a little bit with command line just from the cell here, <laughs> but it's not a substitute for command line operations. So that's good. Uh, I already asked several of these questions about, um, so, you know, so, so currently, if you can program in three languages, it is considered like acceptable. Um, and two really good is really desirable, right? Uh, so you should know one really well. Uh, and usually it's really good to know two really well. For the Apache Spark ecosystem, uh, if you, a lot of people already know Python or R. So at least from academia, that's the two main analytics languages that people know. But uh, it would be, yeah, it'll be very desirable if you know Scala uh, or Java, because, uh, because as I said, Spark is written in these languages. So for some of the lower level operations where you're focusing on, on data ingestion and then you know, loading of, of data and cleaning of data at a, at a, at a lower level stream, then it, it helps to know um, Scala. So of course, most people, most analysts know SQL. So I don't know, 
Um, I'm not very good at SQL, but uh, it's not too hard. So we will learn a little bit of SQL along the way. Um, yeah, so a data engineer is supposed to know more about uh, these sort of ingestion streaming systems like Kafka and Kinesis, and, uh, and also about storage engines like these are all proprietary storage. S3 is uh, Amazon Web Services storage. Uh, I think it's simple scalable storage, S3. Uh, and HDFS, we will see a bit more about it. This is the Hadoop distributed file system that's completely open. Um, so you can actually build your own HDFS cluster. Um, okay. All right, I don't wanna go too much into this. My main uh, reason for embedding these things is to say that, uh, yes, there is a big difference between data engineers and data scientists, and you know someone is primarily one of the two, but it really helps to, to be able to, to know a bit about the other field. Right? So I sort of call this data engineering science, sort of the middle way, where um, you know, the, the, the big advantage is when you're in a team um, working with data scientists and data engineers, there's usually, it really pays to have some people who can understand uh, each other's um, um, tool chains much better. Okay. Um, so here is sort of a high level of history of data analysis and where does big data come from? Um, some, some links. This is quite a, this is a quite a nice, let's see if this opens timeline of big data. Um, oh, except all. So, I mean, this starts <laughs> way back in 1663, but uh, yeah, I mean, you know, so this is ENIAC and, uh, and, and, you know, slowly things start moving forward and uh, we have single machine computers and, and, this is the birth of the big data, right? 21st century. So, um, yeah, in 2006, Amazon launches its web services. So, in fact, this current Databricks instance is provided for free for you uh, by Databricks and it's running on Amazon Web Services, right? So, this is Jeff Bezos' empire. So, um, Amazon Web Services, along with Google, cloud platform as well as Microsoft Azure. Those are the three main public cloud providers. Of course, in China, you have Alibaba and others. Uh, what they have done is basically taken all these machines and put them in their own sort of infrastructure. So you can simply buy um, services. So you can buy cloud computing services. So say a bunch of Linux servers for a unit of one minute. You can specify I want a machine with this much RAM and this much hard disk and this kind of CPU or GPU, and then it has a permanent cost. And so you just basically do your computations basically for a few minutes or whatever, and then uh, you, you tear it down and you don't pay when you're not using, right? So this is kind of a, a cloud model. I will, I will come back to this in more detail in another paper, uh, but I just wanted to see um, um, if this link worked. So yeah, so the reason we have big data is because everything is recorded nowadays. Uh, every, everything you click and you view and all sorts of building events. So this is simply uh, mostly user generated data, right? So a lot of this is essentially uh, archived by various companies and then they usually use it to mine your historical behavior to optimize some other business uh, process down the road. Right? So this is mostly user-generated content. So if you're on Facebook or Instagram, all the banned in Russia and all, but yeah, so you, you get the idea. Science, of course, is uh, extremely important. So we have, for example, Wikipedia that we're embedding. It's really huge, Library of Congress and uh, Twitter Firehose. Uh, so you can do quite a lot of stuff with this type of textual data. There is also data from the Large Hadron Collider. Uh, so someone who did a project last year in this course actually published a paper. She analyzed with the team data from the Large Hadron Collider, uh, genome sequencing data. Um, and I think, are you part of, uh, um, 
uh, the group that has these robot robots with microscopes on them, sorry, uh, cameras on them in BMC? No. Okay. Okay, so yeah, there's this group that, that has this amazing data set. Uh, yeah, so they have these little uh, robotic arms that can do manipulations of like huge wells. And then they take like movies of how the cells are reacting to all the treatments. I don't know. Wait, robots? No, these are microscopes. Yeah, they have- the Small cells and panels. Yeah, yeah. Oh, you're in the same group. So this is Ola, Ola Spiel? No, you're in, I'm in the Okay, okay. So we do a lot of microscopy. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, so that's amazing, right? So that's quite a lot. So, so standard science is now like really heavy with all of this stuff, right? Um, so we, we, will, we will use Spark's uh, graph processing framework. So it's worthwhile to mention that there's a lot of data that's naturally encoded as, as a graph, like which is nodes and nodes or vertices and edges, which can be directed. And then each node can have various properties like usernames and so on. And edges can have like timestamps and whatever, right? So these are properties. Yeah. These are called property graphs. So you can actually do operations on a very large property graph, uh, which is usually very big. So you need to somehow break it into chunks and put them in lots of different machines and do some kind of distributed processing. Uh, some of that originally, uh, the, the engineering versions come from Google as well. Uh, road networks, so take entire open street map of Europe, turn it into a graph, right? Because you can have segments of roadways, intersections, you can pull all them and represent them as nodes and turn them into a large graph. Um, and, you know, use that to somehow make some decisions on optimizing traffic flows or whatever, right? And of course, machine logs are uh, another incredible rich source of data. So you have, um, servers uh, which are constantly recording lots of events that are happening to in, 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 the, in the machines or the sort of internet of things which is like everything is now sort of connected to the internet and um, so all, these are sort of machine logs sensor log data so these are some more pictures um, so this is actually how a cloud data center looks like so you have you know you have a big box like this and inside there there are lots of racks and each rack has many processors and buses and cable and everything is interconnected so this is kind of how like a big data center looks okay this is the cloud i should show you some some i have a cloud on my window where we took a bunch of tiny little intel nucks um, so if people are interested in this type of stuff we should play around um, let me to, um, so, so this is an Intel next unit of computing, for example. So it's a very tiny little box and, uh, you know, you can sort of, yeah, pull things out. It's a little bit more robust than Raspberry Pi, but not much more. Okay. And you can basically stack them on top of each other. They consume very little, uh, electricity and don't produce a lot of heat you can build your own network and so a lot of the the big data systems the open source stuff you can actually uh build your own cluster right so it's it's a very good way to prototype locally oh i don't know i just took all the nux some company was throwing away so i don't <laughs> Uh, I don't know. Let's see what should be the cost roughly. It's, it's not much, I think. It's probably a few thousand crowns. Yeah, I, I don't know. We can look at it later. Um, okay, so, um, so yeah, this is what I mentioned. So as the number of compute nodes increase, because the problem is if you have terabytes of data and you have like, you know, one IO device that's reading from a hard disk, right? If the file is so big, and you, you know you have to wait for this, uh, you know for this process to to read, right? So it's going to read block by block, and it's going to take a long time to linearly read everything, right? So, but if you break it into lots of little pieces, then the the you know the readers in each of the machines can read in parallel, basically, right? So that's the that's the other reason why you want to break up because it, even if if you scale vertically, which means you put a very powerful 
you know, very big hard disk and some of the fastest readers and, and have really massive memory and so on, you're still going to be limited by, by basic IO, right? So that's why you sort of break like this. And as I said, uh, we want fault tolerance, uh, which is simply handling, um, handling hardware failures at the software level. Right? So this is the main idea. Um, I highly recommend reading this one. Um, this one is actually, uh, I, I won't read it now. It is a bit better than the other link that starts from 1600s or something. So this starts from uh, the electronic numerical integrator and calculator, the US Army, um, and it goes a lot faster. So what I wanted to quickly show you is, so yeah, so we have relational databases and SQL coming into the game from the 50s and so on. IBM uh, and later on Oracle releases the first relational database in 1979. So these are called RDBMS systems, or relational database management systems. And this is essentially how, yeah, um, businesses typically kept track of um, what are called structured data and tables, right? So you can actually do various queries on this. And then the kind of, the big data era in some sense starts with Google, uh, I would say this. Um, yeah, so basically Google had this problem of indexing the entire web page, the entire World Wide Web, right? This is not a trivial problem. So they were, they were doing engineering and uh, what they realized is that uh, they couldn't scale uh, in, you know, on a single machine, they had to scale out on lots of you know, machines. And they quickly realized this hardware failure and all these issues. So they came up with uh, various innovations that are still there. They're sort of very low level mathematical engineering innovations. And one of them is called MapReduce. We will do MapReduce later today. Time is flying. So um, yes, I guess we should start top now. Um, I'll continue with this. I really want you to play to today <laughs> in the computer. Okay, so let's see. So yeah, MapReduce is something you will see soon. So the idea is that you have, a, you have input files that are broken down into small pieces. So let me maybe make this a little bigger. So, you know, here we have input files. There's apple, orange, mango, blah, 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 apple, plum, mango, and so on. And the idea is that you take each line and then you uh, you parse it into, um, you know, into uh, strings, you know, just separated by white space. And then you map the key value in, into this kind of a pair. So apple comma one, the apple becomes the key and it, it has count one. There's one instance of apple, right? Same with orange, mango, and so on. So these things are all happening in different computers. Now. That's, that's how you want to think about it, right? And then the... Um, the, 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 the step is then what you want to do is you want to combine all the apples together, some level, right? So all the apples get shuffled, go through the network and end up in one machine, okay? So then uh, this is the reduce step, which is an aggregation step. So here you combine all the apples, so they have the same key, and then you simply count the ones, right? So there are four apples, one grape, and two mango. And then the final output is you figured out that there are four apples, one grape, two mangoes, and so on. And the point is these files could be, you know, split over thousands of hard drives, right? And this is the mapping step. And then this is the reduce step, right? Where you simply, and, and this paradigm of computing is incredibly general and it's very uh, easy to do fault tolerant distributed computing. Because the idea is that if something fails here, say this machine fails, then you only need to compute this part again, right? So everything else may have finished. So it gives you some kind of a, some way of breaking down the computation into chunks, and then you can keep track of which broke down and only, only complete, recomplete that task. Okay. So we will go into these things in a lot more detail. Um, maybe I'll stop now. And we can continue. All right, let's uh, let's get started. Um, so the question is, what should you be able to do at the end of this course? Um, mainly, you will be um, able to understand the principles of fault tolerance scalable computing in Apache Spark. Uh, 
with an emphasis on, on, on Scala, uh, both the in-memory and the generic DAG or directed acyclic graph extensions of the MapReduce framework that Spark builds on. Uh, you will get introduced to resilient distributed data sets for fault tolerance. That sparks a uh, um, basic framework for guaranteeing fault tolerance. These are called RDDs, you will see soon. You'll get skills to process today's big data using state-of-the-art techniques. Uh, so you will mainly do a lot of hands-on coding with realistic data sets, usually in the Databricks environment, unless you learn a bit more software engineering on, on, on the side. And you can also do this uh, locally on your machine, okay? So of course, locally on your machine means you will be building libraries and things like this locally on your machine, but you will still have to do the heavy lifting in a, in a cluster, right? Um, okay, so you will get an intuitive understanding of the ideas behind the technology, not like uh, super detailed in this course, because it's again, quite uh, focused on data analysis and hands-on work. Uh, there will be plenty of academic papers, uh, pointers to academic papers in the literature and technical blogs and a lot of the more cutting edge stuff is actually video streams uh, of libraries. So it's, uh, it's not necessarily academic papers all the time. Right? So these you are expected to read on your own to further your, your understanding. So concretely, you will do something called ETL, extract, transform, and load operations. And after that, you will use this REPL notebook environment to interact, explore, and analyze data. And then from this sort of ETL and IEA, you will do um, scalable machine learning pipelines, which you will uh, use the distributed algorithms and optimization in Apache Spark to train the models, and then hopefully use the trained models for some prediction and insights. Right? So that's kind of the concrete things you will get. Uh, things change extremely fast in this world. So I spent, I don't know, all morning just updating the six notebooks. So much has changed uh, at some level. Some things are, are, are fine. The mathematics is actually getting quite stable. So Reza's course, for example, covers all the basic parallel and distributed algorithms. Uh, so, so the mathematical abstractions of how these algorithms should be analyzed is stabilizing, right? Um, so here is um, where we were. So basically things start with Google. Uh, Google had this uh, basic idea of MapReduce. So this is the paper, Google's paper uh, on MapReduce. So this is a recommended reading. And then, uh, then they, had to do something else also, which is Google's distributed file system. So they also had to make sure that uh, they can store the data in a distributed file system in a fault tolerant way. Okay? So how do you store like a large, a bunch of files you can store in a cluster by, by breaking into small chunks, I said, right? But how do you make sure that if one hardware, one machine fails, say the hard disk fails, how do you make sure that it's it's robust to these faults? And what's the simplest thing you can do without knowing anything about all that? Yeah, exactly. So you make copies, okay? So that's exactly what GFS does in the Google file system. So it basically takes a big chunk of data, partition the small chunks, and each chunk, it basically makes multiple copies of, say, three copies, and then puts you know, copies in different machines. So the probability of all three randomly chosen machines failing is a lot lower than only one, right? So you still, you can still, you know, yeah, pull the plug and everything will crash. But, you know, it's, uh, yeah, that's what the Google file system at a high level does, right? And later on, what happened is Yahoo hired the guys that were doing these things in the Google file system, and then they built an open source version of it called the Hadoop distributed file system. That's really the only, one of the main open source distributed file systems we have. So if you build your own Apache Spark cluster from scratch, you need to have a distributed file system from scratch, and that's usually HDFS. So this Intel cluster I've talked about in my office, it uses Hadoop distributed file system as the base distributed file system on which Apache Spark runs. Okay. Uh, so anyway, I, I don't wanna, you can read this. So of course you have to worry about networking. There's all kinds of errors, right? There's so many things can break in a machine. 
So the software is supposed to be able to handle all of this, right? What are the main other highlights? Uh, so what did Spark do? Spark basically said, okay, um, MapReduce is great. And MapReduce on top of Hadoop distributed file system is great, but uh, this is you know kind of slow. So what the guys in Apache Spark, so they were in Berkeley, a bunch of PhD students in Berkeley. What they realized is that if we can take the data that needs to be processed from BISC, right? And put it in memory, right? Random access memory in a distributed way, then you can access things in memory way faster than in BISC, right? So by essentially caching, you know, sticking things in memory from BISC and keeping it there while computations are still running, you can get massive speed ups. And that's kind of the big innovation in Apache Spot, right? So they just um, did this. Uh, yes, please read this. It's only about 20 minutes. So, uh, and then they started um, doing a lot of nice things where structured query language, uh, SQL, uh, started getting integrated with Spark. So we will start doing this soon, uh, maybe in the next lecture. Um, and they sort of abstracted more and more complexity away from the analyst, right? That's the big thing with Spark. Before you had to do everything, kind of hand roll things and do, you need a lot more you know, domain knowledge. You need to be a much more of a software engineer, but they sort of abstracted and automated a lot of these things. So this is kind of the, yeah, it's a Google file system. This is a terrible picture. Uh, MapReduce, Hadoop, and then there's a bunch of things and Spark 3X is somewhere here in 2020s. Okay, so let me, um, so if I, I think I open this, I'm not sure where this went. Oh, here. So yeah, there is uh, this little uh, Data AI Summit is one of the main places where this community meets. And there is a Data Plus AI Summit for 2022. So if you do an amazing project, you know, you can go present this. Uh, and it's very different from an academic conference. I like to go to these conferences. We met very, very clever people. We don't have PhDs. Or anything like that necessarily, but are very clever, right? This is since uh, since Git became the standard, thanks to Linus. Anyone in the world can contribute anything they can to any project they want to, right? It's transformed, <laughs> transformed industrial R and D, right? Um, okay, wow, it took a long time. So why Spark? Um, I explained a lot of this, but here is a, a really nice paper. Um, you can uh, read in ACM. Uh, it's called Apache Spark Unified Engine for Big Data Processing. Uh, this video, it's, it's worth watching. Um, so the key insights are that it's a simple programming model um, and it can capture streaming, batch, and interactive workloads at the same time. So streaming means the data is coming in a stream, in a continuous stream to your system. So processing a stream is, is very different than processing uh, data that's already been written in batches to a file store, right? Even a distributed file store. So, so historically people dealt with streaming and batch. Historically is like less than three years ago <laughs> separately. And now the Spark provides this unified framework to deal with both streaming and batch in the same application programming interfaces API. So we will see these APIs uh, in the course. Uh, and the, the other important thing is to do interactive analysis on these workloads, right? Because often a data scientist is building some models. You can't just build models out of thin air. You need to interact with the data, uh, you know, a, you know a, and explore the data uh, to build your intuition. So this is again, another thing that Spark provides out of the box. Um, yeah, and then, uh, various applications ranging from finance to scientific data processing and so on um, uh, can be done in Spark. Because Spark is built with uh, something called the Spark Core. So that's at the base. So there are pictures later on, but I'll try to simplify this. So Spark Core is uh, very few thousands of lines of code. Okay, so this is the core. Um, and then on top of it, there are various libraries, the Spark SQL the Spark machine learning library and streaming. A few of these, right? So they build, they're built on top of Spark core. 
And uh, so the streaming uh, and SQL, uh, they, 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 they work together so that you can handle, um, um, you can handle both batch and streaming at the same time, right? So it has a lot of contributors. It's a very fast growing project, right? So you can, you can read about this later. Maybe this is, yeah, second recommended reading. And this video is quite nice. It's four minutes. Um, maybe let's see. Yeah, I don't think I'll play it. You can watch it. So this is basically this blog. It sort of summarizes. So 2003, Google file system happened. Google MapReduce happened 2004. And then people at Yahoo wanted to make open source version of Google's file system and MapReduce, so it's Hadoop. And then these are big hive MR job. These are all various ways of dealing with uh, MapReduce and SQL and so on uh, on top of the Hadoop distributed file system. And they were a bit more difficult, lots of lines of code. Then Spark comes along and then basically brings in distributed memory and things speed up. And then they, they basically, I don't know, get a lot of, lot of venture capital money and hire very clever people and they just go to town, right? So they, they make things more and more abstract and uh, quite useful. Are there alternatives to Spark? Yes, there are lots of alternatives to Spark. Um, uh, currently the world record for the 10 terabyte sort uh, was done by Alibaba in Alibaba Cloud using Apache Spark. It's still the, uh, as far as I know, it's still the world record, right? Sorting, okay. Sorting is one of the most primitive operations, right? The addition is more primitive. So we add, subtract, multiply, divide. Beyond arithmetic, one of the most primitive operations you want to do in computing is sorting, right? Sorting also provides you the handles to do joins. So if you, you know, if you have two tables and you want to join them by some column, some common column, that's another primitive operation, right? So sorting is very important. And sorting usually, so if you have 10 terabytes of whatever, say longs. Uh, integers, long integers, uh, you can't sort it in a single machine, right? So you need to put it in lots of machines and then you have to somehow um, move the data across machines so that they get sorted, right? In some, in some order. So, uh, so Apache Spark still holds the benchmark for this. Um, yes, the, these, these links tell you a, lot, a bit about what are the other alternatives. So in 2022, um, here are sort of Spark, Dask, and Ray. These are sort of three uh, frameworks. Uh, they, you know, Spark is not necessarily the best framework for everything, especially for distributed machine learning workloads. Ray is uh, a, a much more preferred framework. Uh, here, Python objects are first-class citizens, unlike in Spark and Ray. But Ray is just started, you know, okay, it's like a year and so old. It's basically, uh, yeah. The advisor, yeah. So it's the same same group at Berkeley. Um, yeah, or well, the advisors of the guys who made Spark uh, um, are, are creating Ray, right? So <laughs> maybe in a couple of years I will teach in Ray, but right now I, I haven't really gotten into Ray myself. Um, so, but I must say that Apache Spark is still a very popular framework for distributed computing, uh, and it has a very, very rich ecosystem around it. So um, I think this course will still be valuable for several years. Okay. So here are the key papers. So please, uh, so the one with the bold read, I strongly recommend you read it. Even if you don't know any computer science, it's okay. It should be kind of reasonable. So read the Google MapReduce paper the Hadoop distributed file system paper, and then this is the Spark paper, okay? Um, I think the others are okay. So I think now let's get our hands dirty with some code. Right. So you've already logged into Databricks. And uh, so the first thing you wanna do is, um, is to, if you go into the community edition, you will see, you won't see this. This is a, a different, uh, so you wanna start a cluster. You wanna create a cluster and, and uh, start it. So you can also go to compute and you will see, you won't see all these clusters in your, uh, oh no. 
Okay, so I guess the recording is. Okay. So yeah, you can, you can, if you go, if you hit this compute node on your Databricks Community Edition, you know, you, you, you can create cluster and then just give a non empty string for your cluster name and just start it. So then the sort of green thing will start circling, right? So. So then we can start playing. Okay, so now you should have a cluster running. It may take several minutes. Okay, it's the sort of free version of uh, Databricks, so it can take some time. So um, here is the community edition. What is it basically? Um, this notebook essentially is a read, evaluate, print loop on a web browser, right? To understand read, evaluate, print loop in Spark, um, you should really download Spark and uh, do things locally, right? And I've sort of given some instructions here of how to do cloud-free cloud computing. So uh, basically, if you go here, this is the Spark project, right? Um, so for Mac, it's really straightforward. Uh, Windows is a bit more involved, but you can do it. Um, so then you can basically grab one of these pre-built uh, uh, binaries. Um, so just pre-built, just take this default and you can simply download this. So this will come down as a tarball. And um, the only other thing you have to do, and then you unzip it and you can go in. But the only other thing you have to do is uh, install Java. So you need to do you know, Java 8 or 11. Uh, and then once you have Java and uh, download Spark, you should be able to run Spark locally on your on your machine. Okay, and you just type in Spark Shell. Uh, that'll run Scala, Spark Scala, and uh, you can also do PySpark. Um, so that will run a PySpark a Python repo, um, and also the Spark R, I think. Um, so. And if you want like, unless you have the most brand new Mac, because Docker is not ready for the super brand new Mac. I don't know how, how new is your Mac? Uh, M1. Okay, okay, maybe. <laughs> okay, so my, my news is like three weeks old, so. Yeah, um, yeah, so maybe it's all fine. So anyway, Docker is, uh, is uh, I highly recommend it. Uh, we won't have time to get into this, but um, but you should get into this, and you know we can we can spend some time on it if, if if people get stuck. But you should do like a basic tutorial on Docker, and, um, and, and you know just build a small Docker image and know the know the basics. I think where will we go to Docker? Hmm? Is it here? This is a Docker tutorial. Uh, um, okay, so let me see. There should be this is docker.com. Uh, sorry. Docker tutorial. Uh, Yes, oh no. My God, I need to really clear my caches. So there's an official Docker tutorial somewhere. Is this? Oh, goodness. Yeah. Okay, sorry, go here. So docs.docker.com, get started. Um, this is basically. Uh, I think it's totally worthwhile spending some time on it. It'll, it'll help you whatever you do. So you see, once you have Docker set up, 
then you can simply do things like this Docker run, and then you specify the name of a Docker container, and then Docker will just run for you locally, right? So before we get too dirty with, <laughs> with Databricks, I wanna show you a couple of things with Docker, because it's not really too hard. Uh, let me, so that way, Docker, uh, Okay. Um, so then I, I, I gave you this thing here, right? Um, so this is, uh, this is basically my little repository of how I learned Docker. So Docker basically gives you a way of containerizing your, uh, your process. It's, it's not quite the same as a virtual machine, but it basically, um, allows you to, for example, run like a Ubuntu machine inside your Windows machine or, or, or your uh, Mac, for example, right? So the particular Docker that uh, one could use is this one. Um, so this, this is uh, Spark 3x PyX. So dot Docker file is basically an extension for a Docker file. It says from this particular Docker container, right? Uh, do these other things. So basically, it installs Python, and then um, yeah. So now, what is this this Docker file? Uh, it's here. So this is the three x one. So I just wanted to show you. It's not shouldn't be too intimidated by it. So you you start with Ubuntu eighteen oh four. This is you can do something similar, or this should just work for you, right? Once you install Docker, and then I have something called the working directory, which is my slash root. And then I have various environment variables I'm setting up, okay, whatever. So there's Java home, which is uh, Java 8, open JDK and so on, and Spark home and so on. So I have some Spark 3.1 uh, binary with Hadoop 3.2. These are my environment variables. And then what I'm doing here is run apt update and apt install. Yes, 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 you know, non-interactive install of the GNU C compiler, Git, open GDK, 8 JDK. So this is the Java, Vim, I use Vim as my editor. You can put something else, curl, doubly get a bunch of things. Okay, so these are, so it'll just like basically starting a Ubuntu machine from scratch. And then it just boom, 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 gets these things. And then I use, because I put W get, I can use W get to get this binary, right? So this comes from Spark this is where we went the downloads and I extract it, tar, extract compressed file and then I remove it after I've extracted it so now I cd into spark home right because spark home remember I, I set it to be this and I know I mean, this is all like hard coded because I was just learning you can do fancier things but right and then uh, and then I also have a bunch of jars I want because we will do graph frames for distributed vertex programming and some other stuff, Delta Core. This is uh, the the stuff you need for doing Delta Lakes. So it's, it's a kind of file system, and then uh, various other things I want for logging and so on. So okay, basically you 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 start a machine from scratch like Ubuntu, grab things you want, install things you want, and then in the end you can basically have the entry point to be bin bash, and so this Docker file. You can use to build, build your own Docker image, and then you can even put it in your own Docker hub if you want, right? So that's what all of this does. Uh, I just want to say that it's not too too complicated. So let me show you something in action. So if you do Docker pull 3x on your system, uh, if you install Docker, right? Uh, um, so if I do docker pull, uh, Lamastic docker dev spark 3x. So I have this image already in my Docker hub hub. So it'll just pull it down, but because the image already exists in my system, it didn't have to pull it down. Okay. So now I have this image. So if I do docker, that's image. Oh, let's see. So now let's say, okay, I have this image. Um, and I remember very little, so I'm terrible. So I need to look at all the syntax. So yeah, I already built it, right? So once you have a Docker file, you can build it. 
And what I'm trying to do is Docker run, right? So this is basically, I can just do Docker run and then give it, oops, sorry, there. So I'm gonna, um, yeah, so I'm gonna actually copy this. And so what I, so I, I, I'll just show you uh, here, uh, put a comment, paste this, control A, go to the beginning of the line, delete it. So what I'm doing here is this long command, right? Docker run dash dash RM is remove the image when it's finished. Dash D is in daemon mode, dash IT is interactively. And I'm gonna call this uh, Scaramali. So I'm giving it a name, okay? And then the mount is of type bind. So what you have to do is you have to mount your file system on your local machine to the Docker container because the Docker container is running in isolation, right? It can not find the files in your machine. So those of you who know Docker <laughs> can go to sleep for a minute. Okay, so source. So I have to say, what's the source I'm mounting? So this is because I'm running it locally on my system, right? So my home, you know, dollar home is my home directory, right? So, um, so I'm mounting my home directory. Uh, okay, let me mount my entire home directory, okay? And then my destination is uh, root. Uh, I'm gonna call this uh, ras, okay? So my home directory will be available inside the Docker container in a path called root ras, right? So then I do dash p is port because also like, you know, networking, right? So I have lots of ports on my system and in the Docker system, the host system and Docker. So I'm saying map port 4040 to 4040 because Spark UI runs on this, this port. And then, uh, right, so this is Docker dev latest. What, what did we call this? <laughs> Sorry, the thing was called uh, Spark 3X, I think. Yeah. <laughs> Um, yes, so docker dev colon spark 3x. So, so let's see. So now it gave me this big string, right? So something happened. Uh, I don't know what this is. Something happened. <laughs> so if I do docker ps, <laughs> So then they give me all the Docker processes. You see this container, 8A7, blah, 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 this container is running, right? And it has uh, the name Skaramali. This is the one I just launched. Because I launched it in so-called daemon mode, it's running there and I need to connect to it, okay? So that's the second command. And then you'll, you'll see that Spark is ready for you, basically. So this is an easy way to get into Spark, okay? Uh, what should I do? Yeah, here. So then I have to do docker exec is for execute interactively. And then I have to give the name of the container and then bin bash, right? Uh, Scott uh, bin, so bash, so this is the born again shell. So this, <laughs> did I do something wrong? Oh yeah, oopsies, thank you. <laughs> okay, so now you see I'm inside, I'm root at, uh, let me try to make this a little bigger. So I'm root at uh, whatever this container, right? So now remember I, I said, uh, so if you do print working directory, so you're here, root. And if I do ls, it tells me all this. And remember ras is here, right? So if I do ls ras, Why is this Mac, Mac, hmm. okay. Mac is, yeah, whatever. All right, so now I can see everything, right? So now the cool thing is, um, because let's see, Spark. So if I do which Spark shell, hopefully. Yeah, so because I downloaded the binary and you know, so inside, the, inside this thing, Spark shell is there. So basically if you, Oh man, how much time? Okay. Uh, 
I think this is worthwhile, okay? So because I don't want you all to get stuck in the in the Databricks land because it's 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 not good in the long run. Um, yeah, so this is basically when you download that tarball, the PGZ file and unzip it, uh, untar it, this is all the contents in here. So we have so many things, right? We have PySpark, so don't jump into PySpark right away. We'll do it later. The Spark SQL, Spark Shell, and Spark R. And Spark Submit is how you would actually create a, a program locally, and then you submit it to some cluster anywhere in the world, for example. So these are all the binaries available to you, right? So if I now do Spark Shell, right? So it creates what's, because all of this is to explain to you what a REPL is locally, read, evaluate, print loop, REPL environment. So Databricks provides you a REPL environment on a web interface for your convenience, okay? So this will take some time. Okay, there you go. So Spark version 3.0. And then we can do my favorite operation, one plus one. So this is in Scala, okay? So everything you're doing in the in the Databricks, not well, a lot of things you're doing in the Databricks notebooks, you can do it here. And you can, you know, you can create a file called blah blah dot scala, and you can load the file with the load command. And so you can do, and you can do more fancy things. You can use uh, Visual Studio Code and make sure that, yeah, if you are into IDEs, IntelliJ IDE, whatever you want, these are the integrated developer environment. So programmers use this type of stuff. So, okay, that's, that's how to run Spark locally, right? So now let's go back. Uh, so Databricks basically um, has uh, Spark running uh, on a Databricks platform. So this is on AWS. So on the back end, they're provisioning machines. Uh, so Amazon's uh, EC2 instances, like Elastic Cloud instances. And then they use Amazon's uh, S3 distributed file store. It's proprietary. We can see the code for S3. And then uh, they're providing the, you a small cluster like this in community edition so you can play around, right? So these are the main ideas. So you have uh, something called a shard, which is an instance of a Databricks workspace. So we are currently in a shard. Um, so later on, when you do projects, I'll invite you to the shard because then you can have really large clusters and have lots of big data and do some real project. But for now, because I have a tight, tight budget from AWS, it's only 1500 US dollars. So we will save it for the project. And now you can learn in the community edition or fall back on, on your local machine. Okay. So um, the cluster is basically a Spark cluster. That's that's the cluster you created, right? In, in, in community edition, it's a tiny instance. Here, you know, you can choose exactly how you want the cluster to be. So if you go here, for example, the one that someone else is running, you know, it has some Spark 2.4. These are some students working on some older version of Spark. So this is the cluster I'm running on. So if you see it has, you know, this is the, because this is on AWS, the worker type is M4 large. It's a, it's a particular type of uh, machine. Um, it has eight gigabytes of memory, two cores. And I can specify minimum worker, maximum worker, and it's all like provided for you, right? So Databricks, when you go to the sort of professional version, they charge you, they charge you roughly a little bit less than what AWS charges you for the physical hardware, right? They charge you a bit more, but they abstract a lot of the engineering. So you can increase this. Uh, you can choose from lots and lots of machines, right? So if you do storage optimized computing, memory optimized computing, whatever, GPU accelerated, blah, 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 blah. So there's a lot of stuff. We won't do anything now, but the idea is that this Uppsala Skadamali DS project.cloud.databricks.com is a shard that I will invite you to later when we move to module, the third module where you do group projects, okay? Um, okay, so where are we? Log into Databricks. Okay, um, so of course, this is a notebook. It, uh, it's a list of markdown and executable uh, commands, uh, just like Jupyter, right? So this one is a markdown cell. Um, and then, um, yeah, dashboard, it's just 
something to do more interactive in, uh, visualizations. So we won't do much dashboards here. So this is a high level idea. So a bunch of users using their own browser will log into a shard, okay? The shard preserves the state. So if you, if you have a notebook that's running that you did some stuff in, and then you log out, then the notebooks will persist in the shard. Okay, so you can go back to shard, turn on the cluster, and then continue with your notebooks. Right? So, uh, and then the notebooks can be attached or detached to various Spark clusters that you can spin. And these clusters are running in the some some, some cloud. So, Databricks works on all three public clouds. But yeah, this is AWS. Okay, I already told you about this stuff, and. Uh, so you kind of saw Docker in action. And now uh, oh, let's see. So let's go to this one. Um, Databricks uh, is closed source notebooks. So we don't really know um, how they're like, creating these notebooks, but there are open source projects, uh, especially Zeppelin which is extremely good for uh, multilingual notebooks. That means each cell can have its own language, which means when the cell says what language it's using, it needs to you know, launch a kernel for that language in the background and only send cells for that language to that kernel, right? So that's the multilingual part, right? So uh, this is essentially what Databricks does. So here we will see examples of using Python, Scala, R, and SQL, and Markdown uh, cells in the same notebook. So yeah, to create a new notebook, you basically go, um, so this is the workspace. This is where all your directory structures are. So you can kind of, yeah, you can go to your home, um, can create a notebook and so on, right? It's a notebook, you can create a folder. Later on, we will import libraries and do experiments. Um, so that's how you do. Cloning a notebook is easy. You just go to a, any file and simply clone it. So you can you know, make a copy basically. You'll put a parentheses one and then you can change the name and move it somewhere else. Uh, attach the notebook to a cluster. Uh, yeah, we already done this. So you just basically do this and then attach to some cluster that's running. Um, yeah, so here are some examples. So if you wanna create a new cell, you basically go to this plus sign, that'll create a new cell for you. And this example is just how to create a markdown cell. Um, yeah. So if you want to put images, this is just pure markdown, right? So you can see what I'm doing. Okay, so you can control enter uh, to evaluate a cell in place. And then shift enter will evaluate the cell and move to the next cell. That's it. Uh, and you can also use these GUIs if you if you want. So here is our first uh, one plus one equals two. My goodness, this almost took a whole <laughs> Okay, so the first evaluation typically takes some time because Databricks, I don't know, Spark has to set up a lot of things. Um, so that's so by the way, this is a Scala notebook because when we created the notebook, right? You actually said, say new notebook, you can choose the language of the notebook. So each Databricks notebook has a default language. Uh, so in some sense, it's quite, uh, quite rich compared to IPython notebooks. So then uh, we got two back and we can print line. This is just a Scala command print line, system current time in milliseconds. And you can also put percent Scala, but you don't have to because this notebook is already a pure Scala notebook. So the default code cell is Scala, okay? So yeah, here's basically most of the stuff we will use. So percent Scala for Scala, percent Py or Python for Python, percent R for R, percent SQL for SQL, and percent FS for the file system for Databricks. Uh, person sh for a bash shell. So we can drop down into bash shell and person md for markdown. So yeah, here's an example, Python, R, Scala. And uh, later on we will see, you know, you can actually do a process in Scala and then write the result to some, you know, we'll see later on data frames or whatever, some result into the distributed file system and then actually read it from Python. 
because often you may want to do the ETL in Scala, Spark, and then uh, you may want to do some kind of uh, deep learning analysis in, in PySpark. So you, you can actually switch the language uh, and use the right language for the right task, subtask of the entire pipeline. So yeah, so this is just an uh, example of, um, of, of shell, right? So I'm just listing all the files, who am I and root. So, so Databricks, um, yeah, so I'm in this sort of master node that's running this stuff. Uh, yeah, um, the driver node is what it's called. Uh, and I'm running as root in the driver node for, for Databricks. Right? So there are other tricks we will use later. So if you do percent run, and then you can call an entire notebook, different notebook from a particular notebook. So we will use these tricks later so we don't make one notebook super big, right? So we, yeah. um, right, so these are the main pointers. So if you go to this one, whenever you open a link, don't click left click on it, uh, open link in new tab because it'll you will lose the process. Then you have to go back. And, uh, so yeah, uh, it's better to right click and open. Um, yeah, let me open here or here. Um, Right, and this is uh this is the next thing. I guess we will learn Scala. I I, I really thought we will be done with all of this. <laughs> so uh, maybe we will stop today. Uh, this is Scala crash course. Feel free to go through this on your own, and then I'm mainly going to just quickly walk through this. So let's.